right. Um, I imagine some people will arrive a little bit late, but we're going to be starting right now. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Maya Andreasen. I'm going to be the moderator today. That's it. I won't be talking too much. But I'd love to introduce our absolutely wonderful panel that we have today. I'm going to start with uh, Gracie Arenas, who is uh, from Electronic Arts, EA. Um, she is a technical art uh, director at EA. Create um, at Electronic Arts. She oversees all technical aspects of art delivery for the Orlando based EA Sports portfolio. She's a 12 year veteran of the gaming industry and holds credits in AAA titles, including Anthem, Star Wars, The Old Republic, Madden, NFL, NBA Live, and Tiger Woods PGA Tour. She is passionate about leadership and career development, problem solving, programming, art tools, team building and effective communication. As a first female university graduate in her family, she advocates for education and the value of women and minorities in tech. She's a global co-chair for EA Hispanic Latino Employee Resource Group, Somas EA, has volunteered with ACM Seagraph for nearly two decades and is on the industry board for the Texas A&M Department of Visualization. She's originally from San Antonio, Texas. She holds a BS in computer science and MS in visualization sciences from Texas A&M University. Welcome, Gracie. Whoop. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Pat. Glad to be here. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have Lauren Brown. Lauren is currently a lead art outsource manager working at Zynga Games. She started her professional career in the animation industry, working on shows such as Archer on FX before moving to Austin to break into the gaming industry. Lauren is also a professional illustrator, small business owner, and mother to two cats in a perfectly normal amount of plants. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, Lauren. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Mally Rust. Mally is a channel marketing specialist, spreadsheet geek, and passionate defender of the Oxford camera, <laughs> Oxford comma. <laughs> she works at Aspire Media, and she started out her career in MMOs at Daybreak Games and Kings Isle Entertainment, and then shifted to publishing in her current role at Aspire Media. Welcome, Mally. Hey. Uh, next, oh, sorry. <laughs> Next, we have Elizabeth Benke. Elizabeth is an associate level design director at Zynga Boss Alien, working on Star Wars Hunters. She's been doing level design for 13 years on a wide variety of single player and multiplayer action games, including Bioshock Infinite, Doom, Mafia 3, and more. She's originally from Boston, which is wicked awesome, but moved to Austin seven years ago. <laughs> hey, Elizabeth. Hello. <laughs> Alicia Andrew it has been in the industry since 2005. Now she spent the first half of her career working in indie studios based in Austin, Texas. And in 2014, she left the industry to create the company Game Worlds with the goal of changing the industry for the better by educating the next generation of developers. For eight years, Game Worlds has taught students from eight years old to 18 game development and connected them with the game industry. She worked hard to mentor hundreds of kids over the years. In 2020, she joined the team Team at Proteus Games, which works closely with Big Fish as their art director. She continues her work with students and spends what free time she has climbing brightly colored rock walls and running very slowly. <laughs> Welcome, Alicia. Hello. <laughs> All right, so um, I want to get started with this, uh, this panel by really kind of exploring what your journey was through the industry and that's for all of the panelists so um who'd like to get started and let us know what your journey was first maybe lauren <laughs> lauren you guys gonna take smiling like oh no <laughs> it's not me starting it out um so yeah my journey into the industry was uh an interesting and unusual one so I got my start, um, you know, I've been drawing my whole life. I've always loved art, loved video games, loved uh, animation. And I went to college for illustration and animation uh, for my undergrad. And then deciding that I didn't, you know, get enough out of that experience, I decided to go to grad school uh, to Savannah College of Art and Design to get my uh, MFA in illustration. Uh, once I graduated, I was just doing freelance and trying to, you know, make ends meet without like really knowing what the industry was like or anything like that. But I was putting my portfolio out everywhere. And um, I was found one day in August by um, the uh, background director for uh, Floyd County Productions, which is the studio that makes Archer. And she reached out to me, had me do an art test. 
And, you know, the, as they say, the rest was history. Um, so I worked at that studio for four years. I became a background director. And um, with my leadership experience, one of my friends had moved over to EA and he was telling me all about how, you know, how amazing it was and how different the game industry was from animation. And so uh, I just decided that I had nothing to lose. I might as well apply. And when I applied, I realized then I was just like, oh, the process is moving forward. I think I have to leave Atlanta. Because at the time I was in Atlanta. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I don't want to leave Atlanta. But it was too late. I was already doing it. So um, I started working at EA as a lead environment artist, which was, um, which was a very interesting transition between animation and games because it was much more technical. But a lot of the skills transferred over one-to-one. -one. And, um, and I found that that was, um, you know, it, it worked out pretty well. And I really enjoyed the work that I did there. Um, while I was at EA, I also, you know, like Gracie, um, I also worked for the ERGs as well and became uh, the co-lead for BEAT, which is Black EA team, um, and worked a lot with Gracie, actually, between BEAT and SOMOS, and we all supported each other. And uh, so that was my first experience with working with employee resource groups, um, you know, specifically for um, our group in Austin. And uh, after four years, uh, you know, our team was kind of dissolving and I wanted to make a change again. And one of my, um, my previous reports moved over to Zynga. And he told me, he was like, hey, I really like Zynga. This is a really cool place to be. And I was like, okay, like I might as well, I might as well apply. And he was like, yeah, we're also working on Harry Potter. I'm like, go on. <laughs> and so I applied to Zynga and uh, ended up getting the job as a lead out art outsource manager. And currently I'm working as the, uh, the acting associate art director as well. So, um, so that's been a great experience and it's been almost a year now at Zynga. So, um, so overall I've been in the industry for about 10 years now, which is crazy. <laughs> but that's basically my journey into the industry. It was just, um, you know, a lot of just keeping my mind open to what could be out there and the different possibilities because my career did not go the way I thought it was originally going to go. Originally, I thought I was just going to be a character designer working for animation or a visual development artist, but um, but I like the way the path has been laid out for me, and, you know, just the way it worked out. So that's basically how I got into the industry. Fantastic, Lauren. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to, to tell us uh, your journey to where you are right now? It's me, right? Not the other Elizabeth? Or is it the yes, other? Yes, that is correct. No, okay, it's you. okay. <laughs> I want to make sure. What to not confuse it? Just call me Beth. Uh, that makes it easier because I see Elizabeth on the on the panel. Um, anyways, uh, I grew up uh, liking kind of math, science, English, everything but languages, and I didn't know what I wanted to do as a career. But I loved biology and sciences and technology and. Uh, I was interested in genetics, and then I started going to college uh, in the Northeast in, near Boston, um, and I realized, mm, I don't know if I really want to sit in a lab all day, and it takes a long time to really, like, go through the process of testing stuff, and um, there was a really early games program at my school, and I don't know if it necessarily was the best at the time, but it introduced me to the idea that, hey, you can make games for a living. And I had always loved um, playing games as a kid, even if I couldn't afford most of the consoles and uh, all that kind of stuff. I still played a lot, whatever I could get my hands on. And so um, I originally thought I wanted to do environment art and... Uh, I started learning a lot about that, and then I realized, you know, I don't really like making the props. I just like kind of using them in a space and making layouts, and for those who aren't familiar, level design, it's kind of like uh, in a theme park where you see like a top-down map of a theme park, you know, where are all the rides located, where are the paths, uh, what kind of rides are where and all that kind of stuff. So level design is a mixture in between kind of art and design and a little bit of kind of a technical logical mindset as well. So I was really drawn to that. Uh, at the time there was only one school that was teaching level design specifically and it was really expensive. And I was like, uh, I can't afford this. Uh, so I did a lot of teaching myself even though I went to school. Um, and to get into the industry, I uh, it was during the 2009 crash, housing crash, when I graduated, and I'm like, shoot, like I'm coming out fresh in the market. I can't get uh, any any job anywhere, and I got a job at like Starbucks part time, and I was happy. And then I uh, 
I got a job at the night shift as customer support at Turbine on uh, Lord of the Rings Online and Dungeons and Dragons Online. And thankfully, I could actually work on my level design portfolio at night when no one was submitting tickets for issues. Uh, so I just kept persisting at it and networking and working on my portfolio. And eventually, I in Boston, I got, you know, I worked a few internships and jobs, um, had several instances where I got denied for jobs and or um, a job was offered to me and then I left a current job and then they rescinded the job offer to me the day before. So a lot of angering things that almost essentially made me rage quit wanting to be a game developer. <laughs> and uh, But then uh, eventually that led me to working at Irrational on Bioshock Infinite. And that was the biggest game I had worked on before then. Um, and I just I just loved it. And I realized level size is where I want to be. Um, and then of course, after Bioshock Infinite, there were layoffs. Uh, the company essentially said, we, we want to go kind of like indie, artsy. We're going to lay everybody else off. Um, and that's when I came to Austin. And I worked at Certain Affinity for six and a half years. Um, we did a lot of co-dev work, working with other studios on stuff like yeah, Doom and Mafia 3 and some uh, Call of Duty remasters and stuff like that. Um, and now I'm at Zynga and I've only been here about two to three, two and a half months now, um, working on Star Wars Hunters and it's, it's, um, it's a really exciting project. It's um, it's for mobile and Switch, so it's a little bit of a change for me where I'm used to working on console, but it's it's an exciting new market that I'm really excited to work on. So that's my my journey, as short as I can make it. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Alicia, would you like to to tell us your journey? Sure. Um, so yeah, I started in the industry like. Oh, before there were like a lot of like university programs to teach game development. And I uh, was about to graduate from uh, college with an English degree. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my dad actually suggested like, well, you love games, you love art. Why don't you look into that? So I did. Um, and I got a series of internships and first like entry level jobs at some small studios here. Some good experiences, some really bad ones. Um, and then um, mostly spent the first 10 years of my career at small indie studios, um, working for uh, contracting houses, small studios that were working on like, uh, not mobile, but like Facebook titles at that point in time, um, uh, similar to Zynga kind of stuff. Um, and then in about 2014, 2013, uh, I was studio director for a contracting house um, really like my boss, really like the clients that we were working with, but I was really unhappy and I couldn't understand why, um, and spent some time figuring it out. And I basically realized that like, I put a lot of myself into my work, which I'm assuming all of you ladies do as well. Uh, and so like, um, at some point I realized I wanted to, um, spend time really making a difference if I could. Um, and I liked working with kids and I was good at it. So I left the industry completely to start a business uh, that would teach kids game development and software development. And I've done that for eight years and I love it. It was really hard. Uh, being an entrepreneur is very difficult, <laughs> especially with kids, uh, because um, there's not a lot of investment interest in education. I would just put it that way. Um, but uh, have been successful, the company uh, has done well, and we've had hundreds, if not thousands of kids come through our program. And it's really cool to see the kids uh, enter college programs now because they've grown up and they're like pursuing game development seriously, which is awesome. Um, then COVID happened, um, which definitely affected our business because we're a summer camp. And uh, I had a company reach out to me, thanks to Maya, by the way, yeah. Uh, rec who recommended me for an art director position and they aggressively pursued me. And I was like, no, I don't have time. I'm trying to like save my filling, flailing business and uh, got through the summer. And they were like, we're still interested if you're still interested. And I was like, sure, let's see. And uh, did some contract work for them and ended up accepting an offer with them in October. And it has been 
literally the best experience. Like the company works on mobile titles. I love the coworkers. I love my boss. It's a really healthy company. Uh, our publisher developer relationship is really healthy, uh, which uh, I know if you're starting out, like that seems like I'm just a crazy person saying this, but like having a really healthy work environment is so important. Uh, and I value it so much more now than I would have, you know, a decade ago. And so, um, and they're really supportive of the camp. That's one of the reasons why they pursued me is like, they really liked that I was educating um, as like a focus. Uh, so I'm in a really good place with my career now. And I'm happy to like build cool little mobile games, which I'm excited about. Uh, and, and still running the camp. We're gonna try to do our summer camp in 2021. Uh, and I've missed the kids a lot. So uh, that basically, like art director, mostly focused on business, entrepreneur, like all over the place, uh, just trying to uh, do things that make me fulfilled, which is the goal. I, that's it. So I don't have anything else. Bye. Like, that's it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, Alicia. Uh, Gracie, uh, could you please share with us your journey? Yeah, sure. So I was kind of one of those those people who, you know, moms didn't want us to have the NES at home. So you'd look forward to, you know, sleepovers with friends where they did have the NES and you got to play um, duck hunt and whatnot, which was the best. Um, but you know, my mom finally came around when it was super NES time. Um, and I remember, you know, my brother and I are about two years apart and, uh, you know, the game that shipped with Super NES is Super Mario World. And of course, needed a second player so I kind of got looped in immediately um to the whole idea of games and we played a ton of the Super NES dual player games which was a lot of fun um incidentally I own a classic now which is so nostalgic um but that was really kind of the first taste that I had of games but I never really thought about that as a career for one reason or another I didn't ever that never crossed my mind um and while I was growing up it was kind of through that Disney renaissance of the 90s and so you know it was kind of a glamorous thing it's like oh that would be so cool to work in in something like that and so um you know I've, I've always gravitated um to the art side of things I, I took art classes you know all throughout school um throughout 12th grade um but around middle school time um, I actually started doing some summer programs in like engineering and programming and computer science. And I found that I really actually enjoyed that part of it too. It was almost like solving puzzles. Um, and I really liked that aspect of it. Um, and so I found, you know, I really liked that part of it. I like math um, and I like the art. And so, you know, I went through high school, you know, doing art and doing, you know, advanced math classes um, and really wasn't really sure what, what, what was going to happen with all of that. But I had heard about a graduate program at a &M. Um, At the time, it was just the master's program in visualization. And um, my art teacher's uh, son uh, was getting ready to graduate. And so he had come, you know, talked to the art class about what he did and showed some of the you know, programs he was working in and stuff. And I was like, that's actually pretty cool. Um, and so uh, kind of long story short, my college journey ended up being kind of interesting because I applied to art schools. I got into art schools they were all out of state um, and out of state tuition, art schools, very astronomical. Um, you know, my parents were concerned about, you know, the, the whole starving artist thing, you know, how that goes sometimes with parents. Um, and uh, my dad had had a career in tech in the Air Force. And uh, he said, you know, you know, you, you, you like all this tech stuff too. Why not give computer science a try? And so I was a little bit begrudgingly was like, okay, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's fair. You know, I, I, I'm interested in it. Um, not as passionately as art, but, you know, let's do it. And so I did in-state uh, at Texas A&M, did uh, the undergraduate computer science program. And uh, in order to just keep keep my, uh, uh, you know, keep my sanity, because <laughs> I was in a lot of, like, hardcore programming type stuff, I did art classes on the side. And, you know, they, they many of the classes that they had um, then are still offered today was, like, the figure drawing and painting. And then when I went home for the summer, I did community college classes that were art related as well. And we go to the local art studios and do figure drawing and all of that. So I kind of was able to keep it up alongside the, uh, the computer science education. Um, and in order to get into the VIS program, you have to have the portfolio. So it was good motivation to kind of keep those two things going anyway. Um, and then as, you know, as luck would have it, got into that master's program and I was like, okay, so now what? This is actually kind of cool because both of these things that I had been fighting to hold on for so long have actually come together in the, you know, in a program. 
And, um, you know, uh, the Viz Lab is really focused on, I mean, there's a lot of attention put on the, the film industry and getting into films. And so naturally, that's what I thought I was going to do. Um, and there was a chance recruiting visit by EA um, while, while I was a student. And um, one of the things that um, really caught my attention while I was in the interview was just, um, you know, I'd, I'd been screened with so many different companies and um, EA was the first one that looked at my resume and was like, oh my gosh, like at the time I was, I was very involved in the other education at A&M. So getting involved in um, different clubs and organizations and, you know, things outside of my direct line of degree program and getting to work with people from all different areas um, was just really interesting to me. And so I had that stuff on my resume and EA, you know, the recruiters from EA were like, this is really cool that you have leadership experience. And that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody acknowledge that part of my resume, which I thought was really cool. Um, and so uh, long story short, got an internship in Florida, um, super enjoyed the experience. I worked on a golf game, which to me, it was like golf game. That, that can't be that interesting. Well, it was totally fun. Um, worked on the team of five people, was partnered up with a mentor who was phenomenal and just really supportive in the 12 weeks that I did that internship. And um, ultimately, when I went back to finish up my master's, um, you know, I, I actually had two offers in hand. I had one for the film industry and one for games. And I said, you know what? I know what I'm getting back into. I really love the team. Like, there's no question here. I got to go back to games. And so kind of the rest is history from there. And I think a little, a nice little tidbit to kind of end on is that team that I started with about 12 years ago, 80% um, of those people are still in the company today. And I still reach out to them. I still say hello. They, um, one of them I'm working with directly now again, after circling back a couple couple different roles and coming back, getting to work with one of those uh, original colleagues. And um, I think that just really speaks volumes of the special people and bonds that I've been able to form in the company. That's absolutely fabulous. Thank you, Gracie. Mally, how about you tell us uh, what your journey was or is? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, so my my journey starts with a funny story now that was not funny at the time at all. Um, so I, I graduated from UT Austin, but in order to graduate from UT Austin, you have to take an internship class where you have an internship and you go to seminars and you talk about your internship. And I had one lined up. It was a remote internship with a higher education like uh, thought leader and doing content marketing for her and I was like great this is awesome and I get a call from my professor and is like yeah so you know you can't have a remote internship and get credit for this course right and this is my last semester of college so uh, uh no I did not know that and I panicked and then I stopped panicking and said okay time to message everybody that I know on LinkedIn and see what I can make happen so a contact of a contact worked at Daybreak Games which is now Dimensional Inc uh, the office that I worked at and they said, yeah, I guess we could probably use an intern. We can't pay you, but you know, if you need to graduate, we can help you out in a pinch. So I said, great, yeah, uh, let's do that. And so I ended up doing social media work for DC Universe Online there at Daybreak. And my supervisor was very clear with me. He was like, hey, think you're great. Uh, we just went through layoffs. Like one day at work, I walked in and people were crying. <laughs> so uh, they were, he was like, we don't have an entry level position open and we're not going to pay you what you're worth. Uh, but let me reach out to people that I know. And a guy who'd worked at Daybreak was then working at King's Isle, got my resume in front of their hiring director, and I got an interview there as well. Uh, so that was my first gig, uh, was working on Wizard 101 and Pirate 101 uh, and a couple of mobile games that were happening there. Um, did a lot of marketing work for them. And after about a year and a half, I got a contact request from a recruiter at Aspire and they said, hey, looks like you do some pretty cool stuff. What if you did cool stuff at Aspire? And I said, yeah, that sounds pretty dope because you guys work on The Sims 2 and Borderlands 2. And those are two of my favorite games of all time. So interviewed with them. And now my current gig is a channel marketing special specialist, which is a very fancy way of saying I do email marketing, push notification marketing, uh, our launcher marketing, and then a whole bunch of random stuff and a lot of copywriting. So that's journey where I am right now. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Mally. So I'm going to actually uh, take it, we're going to get more kind of into the nitty gritty, actually, because this is a women in game development panel. So one of the, th the next question I'd actually like to ask is, how do you grow your career in an industry that doesn't always have women in leadership positions? And uh, I think I'd like to start actually with Gracie with that question. Yeah, um, I, I can truly attest to, I mean, that question really resonates 
uh, with me because there is nobody in my direct line of work who has been ahead of me. That is a woman um, that does technical art direction. Um, and one of the things I found that was um, very crucial to just my success in the industry and ability to keep moving forward is to find um, very supportive male allies. Um, I would say probably about 80% of my mentors in, in my career have been male. Um, and, you know, it's harder to come by the women, um, but the women that I have had as, as mentors have been phenomenal as well. Um, in my direct line of work, so, you know, it, it was it was males. And I found ones that, you know, were previous managers who were super supportive of my career. Um, you know, while I transitioned roles uh, between sports and Bioware pretty early on, and I actually maintained communication with my manager throughout the entire seven years that I was at Bioware, um, to the point that when I returned to the organization two months ago, I'm actually working with him to transition into his role, and he's moving on to a new role. So you never know how those relationships actually manifest and grow and develop you, but also prepare you, you know, for the next step as well. So really hold on to those relationships and look for people who are supportive of you, um, you know, regardless of gender, because I think that that is very, very crucial um, as part of the journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alicia, what about yourself? Um, how did you kind of, you know, grow your career in an industry that doesn't always support uh, Women I left leadership. it for like eight years. That's what I did. <laughs> Which is, I mean, okay. So honestly, what happened is, is like, I was unhappy with the way that the industry treated myself and other people that I thought were really valuable uh, as employees or developers. And I didn't feel like there was an avenue to change it from within. Uh, and so I made the choice to uh, use my skills, which I'm really good at teaching to, uh, change the next generation of developers. Cause I was like, you know, if all y'all are set in your ways and you're not going to listen, like I can at least teach the next generation and they will be better than we are. Uh, and so I made that choice. Uh, and that's one of the big motivators for why I started the company that I did. Um, and, you know, I didn't come back to the industry until I was approached by a company that really expressed um, the values that I felt like were important uh, to me. Um, and so uh, I value diversity. I value like, you know, trying new things and uh, valuing your uh, player base, uh, regardless of what the demographics are. Um, so those sorts of um, things. Uh, were important. Um, but yeah, so my, my tactic for dealing with my career advancement was to hit my head against the wall for a really long time, then leave, try my own thing, learn a lot, actually learn a lot about development. I learned more um, teaching students than I did the entire 10 years that I was a developer beforehand. I learned more about design, more about programming, more about art. Like I just learned a lot by teaching. And then I came back as a more professional developer um and i feel uh like it was a super valuable time and also getting to see um the next generation of developers like have a space a safe space to grow into um whatever they were wanting to be uh was a really uh was a privilege uh that i still value so um that was my track is i like i abandoned ship and then came back eventually <laughs> When, when, when things solidified in a happier place. So uh, that's my, yeah. It's your journey. <laughs> it, it's a weird, like, just a zigzag, like, yeah, it's a lightning bolt. There you go. That's what it is. So. I think I think most life is, is a lightning bolt. I don't think there's any clear, clear path. Um, Mally, what about yourself? Uh, how have you grown your career in an industry that doesn't always have women in leadership roles? The big thing is not letting myself get kind of pigeonholed by my job description, looking for ways to already, to, because the unfortunate fact for women is oftentimes you have to prove that you're already, you have to basically already be doing the job of the role that you want before you have it and without the pay and without the perks and without the benefits. Um, so 
making sure that you're building opportunities for yourself is really, really critical, um, especially taking in not just, okay, this is my department, but what is the business problem that needs to be solved that nobody else is solving? And then the second is to aggressively but professionally advocate for yourself. Um, nobody's going to know or care about the work that you do, uh, not because it's not good, but because they have other things to worry about. So get yourself in front of leadership as much as possible to prove that you kind of belong at that table with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great advice. Uh, Beth, what about yourself? Um, what's uh, your trajectory kind of been in your career that doesn't always have women in leadership positions? Yeah. Um, so kind of similar to Gracie, there aren't that many women in leads or director level roles for level design specifically. Um, and I started out my career thinking, oh, I don't want to be a lead. I don't want to be a leader. And eventually got to the point where I realized, oh, I really do. I really value helping people. And being a leader is about helping support the rest of your team and rising everybody up and taking away obstacles. Um, but the first thing is that don't let the people on your team tell you that you don't want to be a leader if you actually do. Uh, I've heard so many times people saying, oh, you don't want to be, be a leader. And I kept having to say over and over again, I'm interested in being a manager. I'm interested in being leadership. And then a year later, they'll say, oh, I never knew you wanted to be this. So you have to keep repeating yourself over and over and over again. And because they'll assume you don't want to be a leader, especially if you're like, oh, if you're a woman. Um, and kind of in addition to that, really know who you are um, so that you can't be, well, let's go back to that. Um, I would say know who you are and learn about, uh, educate yourself about like manipulation tactics, uh, like gaslighting, uh, projections of somebody's feelings onto you and all that stuff. Cause you're gonna be in an environment where folks in leadership positions are going to potentially unconsciously or consciously try to um, change who you are uh, because you're unique. Um, and they want you to try to fit into this bubble. But the thing is, because you're unique, you can bring that skill set into being a leader. And so when you learn about that, you can, uh, notice and understand and realize it's not about me. It's not about like, this is not my shortcoming. This is somebody who is insecure with themselves and they're trying to put this on me or all that kind of stuff. And so that makes it so that in certain situations, you might not feel as confident with yourself because you're in that kind of environment. Um, but when you educate yourself on those things, you kind of learn, okay, this is not about me. This is about the other people around me. And if I know who I am and I understand my strengths and weaknesses, then I can advocate for myself as some of the other folks were saying. I can advocate for myself and the skills and talents that I bring uh, and then just keep persisting it over and over again. Uh, and if that doesn't work, find another job like what I did, so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Lauren, what about yourself? Um, how have you grown your career uh, in an industry that doesn't always have women in leadership positions? Yeah, similar to Beth, I also didn't think that I was going to be a leader or going to be somebody who was managing other people at first. I was perfectly content to be the person to keep my head down, do all my art assets and go home after, you know, however many hours they would keep me there. But it wasn't even me who had advocated for myself for that. I was still very young in the industry at the time, but one of my art directors had actually asked me, he was like, hey, do you want to be a, you know, a lead artist for Archer? And at the time I really didn't want to, because I was like this, I know how this project goes. I won't be able to work on anything else if I do this. So I actually turned it down, which I would not recommend. Don't do that. Don't turn down opportunities. Uh, but I was fortunate enough that um, another opportunity did come up. And because I left myself free, uh, I was asked by that same art director again. He was like, hey, I know you turned down, you know, the Archer job a few months ago, but um, I think that was just because you didn't want to continue to work on Archer. Do you want to work on this one instead? And I was just like, actually, yeah, I would love to. I would love to be a director for this. And so I took the opportunity and I just didn't say no to it. I was scared, but I wanted to do a good job. And that was really my first foray into leadership. Like somebody else had believed in me. And, you know, it was because I made myself somebody who was easy to work with and who was good to work with. And he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Um, 
as I progressed in my career as well, I realized that I also had, I could use my voice. I could be more of an advocate for myself. So um, when I came to EA, um, I worked with a lot of amazing people, but there were some people who were still very much, uh, you know, set in their own ways and set in their own head about how things should run and not taking me seriously. And so I started to um, take leadership courses and management courses, and I adopted a vocabulary to be able to fully express myself. And it was this thing that we had all learned taught like from, uh, it was called like talking from your left hand column, which means that you're saying the things that maybe people don't really feel empowered to say, um, that they might be shy to say. And so if I introduced any topic that was like, hey, I would like to speak with, from my left hand column real quick. It would get my manager used to the idea that I was going to say something that was maybe controversial, not controversial, but just like, you know, a pushback or a, a, a critique about what he was doing. And that kind of like softened him up to receive that feedback and opened him up to receive that feedback. And I felt like that was a good way to kind of continue to advocate for myself and for my team more and more. Um, as I grew more confident in my career, you know, it still took a while to fight through all the imposter syndrome. I can often be my own worst enemy being a perfectionist and thinking I'm not good enough. But, you know, comparing myself to other people and, you know, thinking that I'm not doing a good job, like I realized that over time, it's usually just me thinking those things and it's not really the reality of the situation. And, you know, I'd be like, oh, like I did such a bad job. And then the next day I would get really positive feedback and I'm like, oh, like I, I was actually okay. So as I continue to realize that grew in confidence kind of started to push the imposter syndrome aside, I could really begin to use my voice even more. So when I walked into Zynga to interview, I told them right out the gate, I was like, hey, here's my deal. I am going to be an advocate for women, for, you know, for people of color in the game industry, for black people in the game industry. I stand for all these things. I'm going to hold everybody accountable for making that happen in our games, in our studio, in our outreach. And they were just like, yeah, we want that. We like that. And they accepted me, uh, you know, for my position. And I continue to do that work while I'm at Zynga. So if you go in the door and let people know who you are and what they are going to expect, then they're not going to turn their head sideways when you actually start talking about these things because you already told them that you're going to do this. So it's a way to be true to yourself and to state your mission even before you get into a studio. I did it after I became more confident and got more experience in the industry, but I think anybody can really do this and let people know what the deal is right out the gate. If you have that, you know, have that strength, I would definitely recommend being able to do that because it gives you empowerment right in the door. And and my, I think your your question just raises something so interesting that I'm seeing thematically here is that we are seeing ourselves more empowered, kind of as we're making traction here. But the reason why it's been so difficult is because we're kind of trailblazing. There's no example, you know. And I think that that always makes it hard. Like, am I doing this right? Should I be doing this? And and I think that's where the questioning has come in. And I think you know, as we as we've been discussing here, you know, I think we have real obligation as folks who are, you know, trying, women who are trying to pave, pave the trail here, as it were, um, the, the real obligation that we have as women to really keep looking back and lifting up people behind us. I think that, that we have that, you know, obligation, um, you know, being in the positions that we are, because we are the ones that people are looking up to in the industry to, you know, to understand how do I get my own bearings? And I think as we're paving this trail, we need to be very cognizant of that too, because, we, yes, we're advocating for ourselves. We're doing these great things, but we also need to remember to look behind us as well, extend our hands uh, and pull up people behind us too. Yeah, if you get the chance. Yeah, sorry, I'm just gonna follow up with Gracie like with her comment too, because I completely agree. Um, being a part of employee resource groups and work is like one of the most amazing things. And I didn't even know they existed before I got into the game industry, but being able to do that work to reach out to, you know, students and in prospective people who want to get into the industry, things like this, um, you know, donating to places, organizing, like it's totally within your power to do. And it might seem really intimidating at first and really scary if you've never done it, but the more you do something, the more you get used to it and the more it feels second nature. So it's definitely something that, you know, if you find success in the industry, you know, I do take it as one as my responsibility because so many people are not fortunate enough to, you know, to have the resources to get into this industry. And I, you know, I want to do as much as I can to really provide that for people. And I think that people who have gotten to this position, we have the ability to do that as well. So I think it's really, really important. Thank you for yeah. bringing that up, Tracy. Yeah. And, and Mally touched on this too, this idea of kind of taking the reins on your career, like ultimately, 
your career is up to you. You are the one that has to drive it. Um, and so really being cognizant of that fact as well and not, you know, not depending on other people to be opening doors for you. Really, you know, there's a little bit of fight in there that has to happen, but it's always being cognizant that your career is in your hands and, and you can do with it, you know, what, what you want. And, you know, there are decisions where you may have to move or pivot to get the things that you need or speak up to get what you need. Um, but I think those are all important things to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm actually going to kind of uh, piggyback a, a number of you have mentioned having mentors before that have actually really helped you in your career and to get where you are. So um, I think uh, a question a lot of the students would like to know is what would you recommend is the best way to find a mentor when starting out in the industry? And um, uh, I was about to say, I can take this one first since I've, it's a little, it's pretty recent for me. Um, so one of the big things is don't lose touch with the people that you've worked with in the past. Um, my very first mentor was my manager at my internship. He helped me through the negotiation process at my first gig. Um, and then, you know, that was very, very helpful to me. The other thing is to go in, find people that you really admire or appreciate, and then form a real connection with them. Don't just ask them for something. Find things that you have in common. It can even be as simple as, hey, you graduated from where I did. How about the student union food? It hasn't gotten any better, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but reaching out to them and going in with a plan, because when you're trying to find a mentor, you're asking somebody to give up their time and time is really, really valuable. Um, so going in and knowing what you want to get out of the relationship with them and communicating that clearly is tremendously valuable. Um, and the other thing is I listened to a webinar once and they introduced this idea of not just finding a mentor, but building yourself a board of directors. This is a group of people that you trust at all levels, whether it's people that you admire who are further along in their career or peers or people below you whose input that you value and who you trust to talk through things that are important to you, like making a career move or vetting a company. Um, I found that really valuable for me personally. Um, and it can eliminate some of that stress of like, oh, I have to find a mentor right now. Like it has to be somebody super advanced and where I want to be because you can get a lot of value from the people where you're at right now. I actually go next because I have like suggestions. So one thing I would recommend that worked out really well for me is actually take time, like regardless of where you are, even if you're a student, like you, if you have a year of experience, if you have a couple of years of experience, like take time and teach people who are newer than you, because just in the act of teaching, you will learn so much. Like you will learn communication. You will learn your craft in a way that you won't uh, internalize it. Um, because for example, just with art, like you drawing something like, that's great. You're drawing the same thing over and over again, 40 hours a week, but having to actually like explain, teach, uh, share that knowledge with another person makes you understand it in a much deeper way. So regardless of where you are in your career, whether you're starting out, whether you're a student, whether you've got 10 years, like the act of teaching and the act of mentoring itself is a huge benefit to you. And it also helps you and identify like what you need in a mentor, right? Do you need somebody to mentor you on like time management, you know, or do you need somebody to mentor you in um, a career track or how to prioritize or the skills that you need to get to that next level? Um, so I really recommend teaching as a way to mentor yourself. You know, um, when I started out, I was really nervous. Um, I'm a nervous person, you can tell. Uh, but like, uh, I just ended up emailing and like contacting people that I admired and being like, Hey, can I have some of your time? And they were so great. Oh, now we've, we, Alicia has, oh, no. frozen. Um, don't you've, waste you've, time. On... Go ahead. You froze Sorry, for a hot second. Damn it. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was uh, <laughs> Darn it. Anyways, what I was going to say is like, um, I don't know where I froze, but like teach is a big thing I would suggest. And the other thing is, is like reach out to people that you admire. And at the same time, you have worth. So if you reach out to somebody um, and they aren't willing to take the time, do not like pursue them. Do not waste time with that person. Like um, if you email somebody and they don't have time for you, they're not responding to you, go to somebody else. Um, because like uh, the people that I have benefited the most from are the people who recognize the value in taking time to teach me. 
um, and then creating that relationship that was really beneficial to both of us. So like you get something by teaching, you get something by being a mentor and you get something by being mentored too. So it's not a parasitic relationship. So don't, don't treat it like something like that. Like um, uh, put your time into those people who are really enjoying sharing their knowledge and enjoy sharing um, their experience with you. Like spend time with those people. And if somebody comes in with an ego and it's just like, I don't have time to talk to you. Like, like don't, who cares? Like go to somebody else. Like, uh, and then when you have the opportunity, really I would suggest you to take that and teach people who are um, back uh, further along the path, so. I would also kind of add on to that. Um, I think um, it's great to, to if you can find somebody in your field who is a part of the same underrepresented group as you, if possible, it is a huge burden on us to be able to mentor folks, but we're more willing to do it instead of just for white men, honestly, like <laughs> at least for myself. Um, but if you can't find somebody in your specific discipline that is a part of the same underrepresented group as you, uh, you know, look at similar disciplines. I would say it's really valuable because for like for myself, I've never had a level design, female level designer as a mentor before because there aren't that many of us. Um, I've had some male ones, but I do have a lot of female mentors or female communities um, because I'm part of a female under underrepresented group, obviously. Um, and they often will give you insight and mentorship in a way that men can't necessarily relate to or might give you the wrong advice. Like for example, I've often been given advice by, uh, by white men in my career saying, oh, just do it, just do it and apologize later or just do this. And sometimes that works if you have a supportive team, but other times as a woman, at least, I can say that that doesn't always fly. So sometimes the advice that men might give you in a mentorship capacity might not 100% apply to you depending on your situation and how you're perceived in the industry. So even if you're not, even if you, you can't find somebody specifically in the same exact field as you try to foster uh, relationships with people in the same underrepresented group. Also just a shout out to Beth. She has been a huge supporter from like little kid camp, like since the beginning, she's come out and done lectures and been a guest judge. She has made time to like teach the little ones. So like you have been an amazing mentor to like so many kids, by the way, like, like, thank you for that. It, it, uh, very much appreciated. So. Well, I'm going to, uh, I think maybe we'll have time for two more questions to ask the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions from our audience. Uh, so the first question, I think this is a, a really great one. What do you feel is your greatest accomplishment to date? So this persisting. is persisting. Oh, sorry. Oh, you go, you go. I went first. <laughs> oh, last time, I was going to so. say persisting and just staying here and staying around. Because I think uh, the five year mark in games is often, uh, game dev is often when people leave the industry. Um, and that was kind of the point where irrational uh, kind of let everyone go for me. And I think for women and people of color, that number is even greater. And so I feel like there's a lot of things that can discourage you in this industry. And so for myself, I think I've gone through a lot, gone through a lot personally, just like many people have, of course, but just sticking around and persisting and keep pushing through it, I think is my personal biggest accomplishment. Mally. Yeah, so mine is really recent. Um, we just, that we're in like the tail end of a marketing campaign for Stubbs the Zombie, which is a game from 2005 about a zombie that farts and takes off his head and bowls down enemies. Uh, and you are kickstarting a zombie apocalypse. It's a super fun game. And I got to do a lot of really creative work on it. Um, I wrote the fart book, which is our art book. Um, and I've also gotten to write some stuff in our collector's edition. And being able to bring such a fun campaign to life and to be able to put my name behind it is dope. And then I also got to put two streamers that I know personally on the front page of Twitch because we have a partnership with them. And so that was like ultimate chicken soup for the soul. I generated tens of thousands of dollars in, you know, 
equivalent ad spend, I think that's what we call it internally. And I got to put cool people in the front page of Twitch. So big accomplishment. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Lauren, what about yourself? Um, yeah, this was, was also fairly recent, but um, there was an initiative that when I first came on to Zynga, we had an avatar uh, or character created, a creation system in our game. And uh, when we were revamping it, I introduced basically uh, the concepts to them of like, hey, like we can make more diverse hair textures with a hair grading scale. That's something that I grew up with that a lot of people may not know about where um, it's like a scale that measures hair texture from 1A to uh, 4C, which is straightest to curliest. And I was like, hey, like these avatar systems don't usually represent curlier hair textures and kinky hair textures. So let's go ahead and make sure that we're representing the full gamut of the spectrum. And so um, using that language, we were able to also come up with like, you know, ways to make uh, more inclusive facial features, you know, uh, in eyes, nose, mouths, et cetera and just have like, you know, like much more diverse range of skin tones as well. And that ended up, you know, working out really well for the game. And it was really exciting to be able to do that and to represent our players in a really positive way. And it was actually like a, it was a feature in Apple, which was super cool. But, um, you know, like that, like doing things like that, I've been, I've been able to do things like that at EA as well, where um, people from other game teams would come and ask uh, us on the, you know, the black EA team, about things that are in the game that maybe uh, should be vetted by black employees at EA. And, you know, like, hey, like, can we see if this is working? Is this, you know, is this going to be offensive? This is gonna be something that we don't wanna have in our game or something that we do wanna have in our game. And being able to consult and, you know, let let them know, like, you know, the other game devs know, like, hey, this is not gonna work or this, this is a probably better approach is really rewarding because then it shows that our players that there are people who look like them who are helping make these decisions for our game so that we can make sure to represent our players in the best light as possible. So that's been really, really uh, a rewarding part to work in the game industry and actually seeing the results of that and people engaging with that content is really, really cool. Um, you know, as well as like all the other outreach and, you know, advocacy that I've done for, for other schools and everything just to uplift students and, and people that are around the industry that really want to get in and actually seeing their successes. Like those things are just, you know, that's one of the most rewarding things about working in the game industry for sure. It's absolutely fabulous. I'm like super excited about these avatars, by the way, Lauren. Like, this makes me happy. <laughs> uh, Gracie, what about yourself? Gosh, this is a, it was something I'm struggling with. I think um, as far as, as direct work on a game, it would be it would be shipping Anthem. And that was because I was brought into the technical art director role a year and a half before we shipped. So everything was already in motion. It was about getting everything organized out the door. Uh, corralling my team of you know, seven people, making sure that we had everything prioritized and in order um, and ready ready to get out the door. And I remember it was just such a whirlwind. I was going to Edmonton, flying to Edmonton once a month. I ended up, by the, by the whole time I was at Bioware, I went to Edmonton like 15 times. You know, I was there really, really in there, hands-on, trying to get things out the door. And there was such a huge sense of accomplishment when it was shipped. Um, and super proud of the art that came out of that. And um, you know, I think I'll always look back at that time as just, it was a lot of hard work, but also, you know, being able to just sort of take on that role more or less last minute in terms of the whole timeline of that project and be able to um, help help deliver it, I think was, uh, you know, truly a great accomplishment. And I think what that really set the stage for was the ability to then, you know, as I moved to a new business unit most recently, I actually had the opportunity to really formulate what my job looked like. And I think to be able to get to a par, you know, to a um, to a position in a, in a company where you can help architect what your role looks like, to me, I think that that has been a huge success because I, you know, I felt like I've been able to advocate for my greatest skills and greatest strengths and be able to work with somebody to, to really put something together to where I feel like I have so much energy coming into work every day. I love what I do. It's great that I'm getting paid for it, but I love the interaction that I have with people. I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm accomplishing. And I think that that is um, just, you know, the hugest accomplishment in my eyes to be at this stage in my career. That's absolutely fabulous. Um, Alicia, how about yourself? Uh, I made a lot of really good art. I'd say the the biggest accomplishment is actually like seeing a bunch like 
uh, being able to create a safe space for kids to explore their passions in a place that rewards them for it, um, where they feel safe doing it, um, and they get to really like be themselves. Like that, that is the, the biggest accomplishment I have done with my life is like I've made a space for them uh, to, to, to be themselves. Like I've had a lot of really good experiences with um, kids learning stuff that they really enjoy doing, getting to explore um, their identity in a safe place where like the kids and the adults in the room um, uh, validate that. And uh, I feel like uh, that's what I was meant to do if I was gonna like get all poetic, you know? So it's important to me and I love making games and I still love it like as passionately as I did when I started. But um, working with the kids is something uh, different. It's uh, uh, it's uh, more meaningful to me. So, yeah. I have worked at Game World Summer Camp, and I can uh, vouch for what Alicia is saying. It's super fun, and the kids are like just really amazing. Uh, Beth. Also, they make badass games, by the way. Like I just have to say, like the kids have a week to make a whole damn game. They do, and they do the art, the code, design, audio, everything, and then they pitch it in a business like presentation. And they work their little butts off, and they do an amazing job. And it makes me, as a developer, feel super lazy, like so lazy. And like there's no excuse for like the quality of work I produced in the week, space of a week. Did everyone, uh, was everyone able to answer that question? Or did I, I, okay, fantastic. Okay, so the last question uh, that I have is what has made you all keep going despite adversity? Uh, I wanna I wanna like stop on a positive note there because uh, the games industry, it could, be, it could be difficult, it could be hard. I mean, any industry can. So I'd love to hear uh, the panel's take. And let's start with Lauren. She knew I was going to ask her. You knew it. You knew it. Um, yeah. You're right below me in, in Zoom. <laughs> I'm just right. I'm a target. This is great. <laughs> no, I, I really think that the game industry has been, you know, despite all the, the shortcomings and setbacks and the challenges that, you know, I faced and I'm sure a lot of people have faced, it is really just a fantastic opportunity to actually create something that you then know that people, you know, may, possibly millions of people are going to be able to see and play and engage with. And being able to have a positive impact on what they're engaging with is really important to me. And I think it's really the most rewarding thing about it. Um, but in addition to that, like once you find a great team to work with, it's really hard to ever want to leave that because it's so hard to find a great manager, a great team, just like a really positive group of people. And being able to work with people who are nerds like you and share memes like you and just laugh and just chat and you become friends with them. It's, you know, there's, there's nothing like it. And, um, and I found this rewarding in both games and animation where you just meet so many amazing people and, you know, you get to participate in things like this where you get to share your insights and meet new people even from this. And, you know, it's just been, I think it's just been a great experience and I feel really overall uh, fortunate to be able to be a part of it and to be able to be a rare face in this industry because you know, even still, like I, I don't work alongside any other game devs who look like me. And, um, you know, it's been really rare. So, but I'm happy to be a representative, at least for, you know, Black women in games and to be able to say, hey, we are out here and this is a space that's for us too. And to be able to spread that message is something that I'm going to continue to do until my last breath, because I really, really want to see other people who look like me in the industry and for them to know and feel confident that they are allowed the space to work here too, and that they are more than you know welcome to take it up because we need more of our voices. So that's why I stay in the industry. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Beth, what about yourself? Uh, sorry, I'm tearing up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, I think the games industry is a huge, massive, influential medium right now, and um, media is a part of our culture and we have such an influence on our culture that we can change things for the better. And I know that it's very frustrating, especially those of us who've been here a while, 
where the industry can be very toxic at times and the fan base can be very toxic at times, but we can also help be a part of the change to push back and say, no, we won't accept this abuse from players or from other developers and we can help push things for the better. And I'm always surprised whenever I advocate for things, all the people behind the scenes who are like, thank you for saying something because I felt like I didn't need to. At, oh, not I didn't need to, I felt like I couldn't. And I think once you get the boldness of knowing that you're unique and that you're just gonna be unique no matter what, you embrace it and you, you can just push for things and help make things better for everybody and help um, make games that have more representation of what people look like in the world and what people experience in life. Um, and also kind of going on what Lauren says, the feeling of collaborating with people where you're all working together on a shared goal and brainstorming together and you're all getting excited and hyped up about something and you're like, yeah, let's do it. Woo! is like the best feeling in the world. And that's one of the reasons why I've stayed around so long. Gracie, would you like to share with us, uh, despite any like ad adversity, what, what's kept you going? in in the industry yeah I, I think it's really easy to get fixated on some of the statistics associated with the industry particularly when you see um in the u.s you've got almost 50 50 exact split um, between um you know female and male game players in the united states yet the representation within the industry for women is about 26 percent um so we there's still a long way to go as far as um, more representation um, in the games industry. And it definitely is disheartening to me when I hear other women's stories within the industry, because I feel like, you know, it's, you know, everybody's experience is different. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've had a, a lucky experience being, you know, being uh, surrounded by maybe some, some, some of the right people. Um, it, it, you know, it, it all depends on personal experience. Um, and I think, you know, going back to my original point, it's really easy to dwell on the numbers and focus on the people who are sitting in the room as you're in meetings. Um, and instead of focusing on those things, I actually choose to focus instead on what do I bring to the table? What skills and abilities do I have um, to contribute to this team? that no one else has, you know, and how do I really make that shine? And I think focusing energies in that way, it just has allowed me to be more fruitful in my roles. Um, I think because, because we can draw on those numbers all we want, but the reality is if we are going to make it any better, you know, we've got to really put our, put our foot in the ground and really keep trailblazing against this path and, and bringing people up alongside with us. Um, so really focusing on what you have the ability to accomplish and surround yourself with people who support you um, is, is entirely crucial because it's easy to feel like you're alone or unsupportive. But, you know, as, as Lauren has mentioned with, with employee resource groups, um, you know, find, you know, previous managers who have been supportive, find, you know, find those people, even if they aren't in your direct line of work, the people that are there to support you and elevate you. As you uh, as you go through your career, because you'll need you'll need time. There'll be times when you'll need to to you know lean on those people for support. You know, it's it's a it's careers are 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 tiring, and there's a lot of you know being in the industry for a while. There's lots of things that happen, and so you need that network of support to be able to continue moving forward. So stop and take a breath every once in a while look at how far you've come, really think and assess on how to progress moving forward, make sure you've got the right people surrounding you and keep doing it because we need, you know, we need more of us here. And the only way that's gonna happen is with, you know, we've got to have more persistence. We've got to be committed to making that change. Absolutely. Uh, Maui and then Alicia. Cool. Uh, I ha literally have a Google doc titled uh, How I Kicked Ass. And every single time I feel like I have an achievement, I put it down um, because one of the things that makes that can be hard in adversity is you think, oh gosh, everything is terrible. And for me, I get into this rumination cycle of, I can't do this, maybe I'm not good enough. Oh my God, oh my God. And then I go back to my list and I say, no, like here's the tangible results of the things that I have done and the ways that it has benefited myself and my company. And as an added bonus, it makes writing your resume so much easier because you just have that list. Um, 
But keeping on to the good when the adversity comes is really helpful for me. Uh, Self-compassion is another big one. It's not just self-confidence. It's about being kind to yourself when you feel like things aren't good or like you're not good enough. Um, That's been huge. And then remembering that nothing's going to change if nobody does anything about it. Like when you have a moment of total suck, you have an option. You can either say, wow, that sucks. Or you can say, wow, that sucks. How can I make it not suck for somebody else? Um, And that's been touched on a lot. I don't think I need to go deep dive into that. But it's just something to keep in mind as you experience things that, uh, you know, suck. (laughs) So uh, the question was like, how have we sustained, how have we been in the industry? Yeah. Uh, so I'm a stubborn bitch. And so I think that I have just as much right to be here as anybody else. And like, I have loved games since I was a little kid. And just because somebody thinks that I don't belong here doesn't mean that I don't. So I love video games and I love interactive media. And I think there's something magical and special in it. And I think there's something in it that can influence and change the world around us for the better. And I refuse to allow a group of people that I disagree with fundamentally control that space. And so like how I deal with that is I like teaching because I think that that's one way to, to um, sort of bring those values to a younger generation, but also I uh, am a good artist. I am a good manager. I need to remind myself of that on a daily basis that like I um, have just as much right to take up space in this industry as anybody else. Uh, And I think that that's like the message that I wanna convey to um, myself, but also the people that I'm teaching and the people that I'm mentoring. Um, That there is something really cool about making games. Uh, There is something amazing in creating these make-believe worlds um, where you can see a wide diversity of experiences and possibilities. um, And that should be um, valued um, and also open to everyone. And so I believe that. That's why I keep doing the thing I'm doing. That's it. <laughs> so. Well, um, thank you uh, to our panel. I would love to open the floor for this last 20 minutes uh, to ask our wonderful panel uh, questions. So uh, for those in the audience, you can either type your questions in the chat or turn on your camera. You don't have to turn on your camera, but ask your questions uh, verbally. Just remember to unmute yourself when you do. Um, And we actually have a first question from Jacqueline Cardova already. Um, And Jacqueline says, some of you mentioned that being in a healthy workplace workplace is important. Are there any red flags we should look for while pursuing a career in the gaming industry? That's a great question. I think all of us smiled because we've all seen the red flags before. (laughs) I think, If you see a culture that is promoting a lot of um, very one-sided ideals, I'll just say very diplomatically, um, you know, cultures that kind of uh, emphasize, you know, being the loudest in the room, uh, championing people who are working late or working their butt off, even though they shouldn't be, um, and, you know, rewarding them for that kind of behavior rather than rewarding them for just good work. Um, If you see uh, you know, like managers or people who are actively trying to pit people against each other and not healthy competition, but actually trying to put down somebody else in favor of somebody else. You know, those are, those are kind of the things that you should definitely look out for. Um, you know, if you, if you see a situation where people are trying to bring up advocacy issues and people are, they're just not being heard, their voices are not being like listened to at all. And it can happen in multiple workspaces for sure. But if it's a recurring thing that nobody is really there to listen, that's a really bad sign because you know that, you know, there's probably so many other issues that haven't been able to be brought up because it just falls on deaf ears and you don't know what happens behind the scenes because it's unheard and unsaid. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of red flags, but those are the first ones I can think of off the top of my head. But I'm sure that everybody else (laughs) has a lot of uh, things to say about this too. If you're working in an environment where people cannot admit that they're wrong or listen to other viewpoints, that's a huge red flag. Like 
if somebody like disagrees with you, there should be like the openness that they uh, might change their mindset with new information. If you live and die on the hill of being right, that's an unhealthy environment, unhealthy relationship with regards to work. Like it should be like, we're all in this together. We're all on the same team. Like I might have ideas. I might have viewpoints, but like, I'm also valuing your ideas and your viewpoints. Being right is not the hill people should die on if you're in a healthy environment. Yeah, what Alicia was speaking to is the idea, the idea of psychological safety. Everybody should feel comfortable being able to um, voice their opinion, even if people disagree, and be able to have a healthy dialogue around it and be able to be properly acknowledged. Um, in every aspect of work that they do. So, you know, I would, I would encourage you to kind of read up on that because that's a huge uh, topic of discussion. Um, just to make sure that, you know, we are being cognizant, you know, and, and me as a manager, certainly cognizant of it, about creating an environment where everybody, men and women, feel, feel like they can equally contribute. One of the Absolutely. common oh. red flags also that I see in job descriptions is, work hard, play hard. We're a family. Uh, I don't know if other people I know have like really great family experiences, but if a company is framing it as a family, oftentimes, not always, sometimes there really just genuinely is a very loving and caring and supportive environment. Um, but it means that you will probably be forming a lot of close relationships that will make it difficult to have difficult conversations. And you may be a family because you work 12 hours a day and you don't see your family anymore. Um, so really being aware and asking questions about, hey, what does work-life balance actually look like here? And are we able to separate ourselves as professionals? Like that is a big thing for, for healthy workplaces. Absolutely, 100%. Sorry, my, my uh, <laughs> I tried to unmute myself and was I was going to add one more thing real quick, because this is just the, the woman's perspective here, but also, um, you know, how uh, cognizant they are um, on, you know, uh, policies like uh, maternity leave and things like that, um, I think are incredibly important. You know, I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, I've got two kids. I had one that I had last year at the beginning of the pandemic. And, um, you know, I had we had we have 10 weeks of new parent leave Fan, fantastic phenomenal i was able to have you know my my kid here for work from home for a whole year before he went to daycare so really look at um those types of policies that the company sets forward and how they view them um because i think it's also important to take into account um you know women's issues as well regardless so, of whether or not you want to have kids or like uh whether you're male female or whatever like maternity leave policies will indicate to you the studio's uh, commitment to your work-life balance. So like, even if you're like, ah, I'm never gonna have kids. Like if they don't have a robust maternity leave, that's saying something about like the studio's values regarding their employees. To kind of add to Alicia's earlier point about, I think it was Alicia that said that about creating an environment of, as Gracie said, psychological safety, um, where people feel comfortable um, Admitting they're wrong, uh, something that I like to do in interview loops when I'm either being interviewed at a company and trying to decide if I want to work there or if I'm interviewing somebody else for my company is to find a place where I could disagree with somebody and I say, you know, uh, I see where you're going here, but I think this, you know, isn't right or, you know, Try, try to push back a little bit and see how they respond. Because I think especially as women, some men don't feel comfortable with women disagreeing with them, unfortunately. And so making sure you're going into an environment where you feel comfortable bringing up problems, whether they're like professional problems, you know, like, oh, hey, I don't think we have enough time to get this work done, or I'm concerned with the way we're representing this character, you know, or I, need to, as a designer, I need to advocate for the design side of things. There's always going to be people disagreeing with each other. And so if you're interviewing somewhere and you find that the people who you're talking to, the way that they respond is not in a collaborative way, but in a defensive way or a way that's 
where they got really angry and upset and they push back against you when your disagreement was completely calm and reasonable. That's also a sign early on that you can tell what, whether that's going to be a, a psychological safety environment before you actually start the job. That is really good advice. That's actually an excellent, excellent way to get uh, see a red flag. Um, does anyone else have a question? Remember, you can uh, type it in the chat or you can ask it verbally. Uh, Jacqueline, by the way, says thank you for answering her question. And if nobody else has a question, I actually uh, do have a question. Um, I was wondering what opportunities exist now uh, that didn't in the distant or recent past kind of in the industry and, you know, I'm framing it around women in particular um, and uh, minorities and and uh, and people in marginalized groups. I think one of the big opportunities is that we're talking about things. It's not just a sweep it under the rug. Oh yeah, thank you for escalating that to HR. And then you just disappear into the black hole of whatever ticketing system they use. Like as companies are starting to discuss it openly, as an industry, we're starting to discuss it openly. And you know, dialogue is the first step to action. So I would say that that's been a big opportunity that didn't necessarily exist in the past. And that's how you can tell a healthier workplace is if they don't put it in the queue. Cause I've definitely experienced that. And so it definitely still does happen where they might not take you seriously or the ticket to HR gets put in a queue and they don't pay attention to it. But there's a lot more companies that are actively trying to get better at that. I will say this is not specifically related to um uh in in the, sorry any individual group with games but just in general like game education is way way more accessible now than it was when i started and a bunch of us started so i would really recommend all of you especially students for the love of goodness please god just make games like you have like there are like i can give you like if you email me like i'll give my uh, my information i have an entire list a free or low cost and easily accessible software where you can start building games. I have a list of game jams where you can participate, start building things. Like this idea that there's a giant gate between you as a baby game developer and making games, that doesn't exist. So start building stuff now because what I always mentor, like especially my older students is, um, that's great, you can go to school, you need that foundational skill, but you also need to be building stuff and, sh and like, because one, it'll teach you what you're interested in and teach you what you're excited about and what you love doing. Um, and you have that opportunity. So you should be building games and like, yeah, the first few games that you build are going to be ugly and broken and sad pieces of crap. And that's fine. Like that's just a learning experience, but like, please, 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 please. If I can emphasize anything, like just start building stuff now because the tools exist. They didn't exist 10 years ago. And you have such a library, such a wealth of resources available to you, regardless of which field you're interested in, in development, there's so much learning that you can do and you should be doing it now because it's extremely competitive. Um, it's extremely competitive. Like if you have one job opening, hundreds of people are applying for that and they are talented and obviously they have like some connections because they're like even being seen. So please, please, please like start building stuff now. There's not a like magical like gate that opens because somebody gave you permission to start building games. Like, sorry, like a little bit of like a leeway, but important, I'll die on this hill, so you know. Um, I would yeah. say two kind Grace. of the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lauren. Oh. Well, all right. So, and Mally, uh, Mally kind of touched on this too. Lauren had a point on this, but um, it's just sort of this idea of um, of employee resource groups um, really elevating, um, you know, specific uh, groups, uh, underrepresented groups uh, within our companies is also there's a heightened awareness of that now. Um, and so, you know, you'll probably see that that term, you know 
uh, thrown around more and more, uh, ERGs, employee resource groups, and it's, you know, it's given a voice to uh, otherwise, you know, people who have otherwise not had an opportunity or been able to find people that look like them, you know, within the workplace and, you know, find opportunities to, uh, to collaborate and work with um, senior leadership or, you know, other mechanisms to really drive programs that can increase retention, um, that can help drive policy that is more fruitful um, for underrepresented, underrepresented groups. Um, you know, I've seen that as a huge change within the last five years or so. Um, and that wasn't, that wasn't in the industry when I started. So it's really great to see the community that's building around um, those affinity groups um, that's really helped driving those discussions and uh, making it a, a relevant topic for us to continue driving forward today. Yeah, we have, um, I know Lauren was uh, going to answer and actually maybe you could segue into this last question that we have from students because um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, so uh, Amy asked, I've heard some people say diversity in gaming doesn't matter because at the end of the day, all that matters is how well you play as well is how well you play. I personally don't believe this. How would you respond to this? Okay, so the first answer um, was to the original, the other question, um, which the only thing I had to add was uh, you also, there's a lot of hashtags on Twitter now on social media that you can leverage to get your, uh, get your work more noticed, especially if you're from a group of people who are underrepresented because now there's so much increased awareness around this that you can leverage those. We are POC in play. Uh, you know, Blacks and Gaming, um, yeah, I believe it's, um, uh, it's, there's like a Portfolio Day, um, Black Portfolio Day, et cetera. So there's a bunch of things that you can use and leverage to, and, and companies actually look at these hashtags as well. So um, just can, keep that in mind as well. There's just so much out there that you can use uh, to, you know, to be able to show your work where before you couldn't. But to the second question, um, you know, I know that you personally don't believe this, so I'm just, I feel comfortable with saying it, but that is such a small-minded view on what games actually mean to people because it's not about how well you play. It's not actually, it's like mostly not how, like that you're thinking about competitive games, you're thinking about, you know, stuff like if you're an esports professional, like that's, that is the only thing that matters of like how well you play, like maybe, like mainly also your persona matters too. But for games as an overall experience, that is not the only thing that matters. You have the story, you have the gameplay, you have the art, you have the characters, you have so much that immerses a person in the experience of playing a game. And when you see over and over again, people who don't look like you and people who don't represent where you come from or don't seem to understand you, it begins to feel very exclusive. And when you actually see, start to see more inclusion, more diversity, and you're like, oh, wow, like this character actually has very similar experience to mine. It's a very, very personal thing for different people to actually see that. You know, like even this is a silly example, but even when I was, I'm a, I've been a Pokemon player since Pokemon first came out. When Pokemon first was releasing darker skin options for my main character, that like blew me away. I couldn't believe it. I was like, they like Nintendo finally saw me. Like that's what it felt like. It was a very, very personal experience. And I feel like that's, that plays into so much about what we want to give our players when we're creating games. Um, you know, we really want to make them feel seen. And I feel like only narrowing down the experience of gaming to how well you play is just the smallest thing you could do. If I could add on to that, I know you I saw, I said so wrong immediately in the chat. It just makes me so mad when I see stuff like that because it's so wrong, both on a um, personal uh, societal standpoint and also from a business standpoint. So uh, from a business standpoint, you know, um, the more people you can reach and the broader audience you can create, the more people who are going to be playing your games and um, the more people feel connected to the games and are able to play characters that look like them, the more they're going to stay for longer. Um, and that's a great business decision because I'm thinking about the fact that like, you know, I've, I work and also play in a genre that is traditionally considered male dominated even more than the others. So, you know, first person shooters or third person shooters, especially multiplayer games. And people are like, oh, there's no women in this field. There's no reason to create female characters. Um, and then like Fortnite and Apex Legends uh, started creating more inclusive characters. And they also started creating them on mobile and other more accessible devices. And I think it was in 2018 or 2019, they found that 
uh, more than half of the mobile players in Fortnite were actually teenage girls. And so that's like a huge new market. Uh, and because of that is that, for example, Fortnite is able to provide a whole bunch of different types of characters and ways for people to express themselves and accessibility. Um, and it's not just how you play, but it's who you play as. And I think that's something I'm not to not to like to my own horn or whatever, but the game that I just joined, they're trying to do the same thing as well as trying to create characters uh, in the Star Wars universe that are a wide swath of the people there to, in order to connect with people. Because, I mean, if you're only limiting yourself to who the who the current audience is, then you're limiting your market. And obviously from a social standpoint too, I think only thinking about money is awful and we should try to make the world a better place. And so why not make things that make people feel like what Lauren was saying, where she feels so excited when she gets to play with somebody who looks like her. Also, I want to piggyback on what y'all are saying. Like the idea of like reported numbers of like who's playing what are like, they're self-reported. And I personally like, so I have seen for myself for eight years, like I'll go and do like school presentations. And like, I have 11 year old girls who are like, I love Call of Duty. Like I played it my entire life since I was like five. I've been like dedicated to this game. And I come back two years later and they're 13 and they're like, I've never touched a game in my life. I have no idea what games are. I have never played one. And there is a cultural like pressure to not be um, weird or to not like fall outside of your very narrow box. So the perception that like women don't play games, perception that like people of color don't play games and like certain genres, those sorts of things, like that's false um, because you don't actually have accurate data because if you're, re if you're relying on self-reported numbers and those people don't feel comfortable saying or identifying as that demographic, especially if it's a really hostile, um, it's an unwelcoming place, you're getting skewed market data. So, um, you know, I mean, think about this way, like, I don't know about you ladies, but like, if I play like sh a shooter, if I play Overwatch, if I play Call of Duty, like I'm not on voice chat, like I'm not talking, right? And so like the assumption is, is that like women don't play. I play a hell of a lot, right? And I'm not the only one. So you're getting like a very like narrow viewpoint of who your gamer base is. Um, so don't make assumptions about your player base. Um, and lock out other people who would otherwise fully participate in your game experience with just a little bit of effort to include them, right? Like that's the thing is like adding a new skin, adding new hairstyles, adding new body type, body types, like those are work and those are money, but they're a small uh, energy expenditure for what could be a huge return in player retention, player engagement, so. Yeah, and one thing to add on that, it's got to be done the right way too as well, because you can add those types of things in, but if they're not done with the right insight, um, you know, from from people who are part of that community, often it can backfire. Um, so really being cognizant of bringing in the right people to sort of vet, you know, vet those additions to make sure that they are accurately reflecting the culture, you know, and, and we've seen some examples at my own company where you bring in people from employee resource groups or whatever to make sure that that content is truly accurate and representative of the community that is being represented. That's why it's hugely important to have diverse voices on your development mm -hmm. team so you aren't exactly. just like navel gazing. Because like I have an I have a ton of bias. I have a ton of blind spots. Like talking to somebody who does not have my same lived experiences is insanely invaluable. Like we need or is insanely valuable. Like we need to like like value uh, put an emphasis on uh, making effort to like incorporate that into our development process. Well, um, I have to say that this has been an absolutely fabulous panel, and I want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time today to come and speak to our students. Um, uh, this is being recorded, so I will send an email out to everyone once it is up, uh, the video is done and up uh, on YouTube. And I do want to mention to everyone, if you haven't been in the chat, uh, that our wonderful panel has put their contact information and their portfolio links in the chat. Remember Zoom, you can't go back and get that stuff once you leave Zoom. So I highly recommend you go and get that information now before you leave today. And um, just uh, one other thing, just thank you so much. Thank you for putting this together. This was super fun. 
And I know it's a lot of work to schedule, like we're like, de like scheduling developers is like herding cats. <laughs> it's awful. Uh, so I have to say thank you very much for all of your efforts, Maya, to get all of this set and like coordinating with the students. It was super fun. It's uh, well worth the time. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Maya. <laughs> You're thank welcome. Thank you everybody for attending and you know listening to us talk. <laughs> yeah, Is there a way we can send our contact info out after this? Yeah, actually, um, if if you don't, if you all don't mind me sending your contact information, and also if you have a specific email that you'd like for me to send to the students, I have all the students who. Uh, registered and signed up for this and so I can I can send your emails out and also we have a couple uh, faculty members here who invited a few other students that weren't on the initial registration and so they can they can get the rest of that contact information out to those students who joined. Also this is really cool to see all of you fellow lady developers like I like it's, admire y'all like this is so cool like I just sit here listening to y'all going this is amazing like I'm gonna <laughs> Why? Like, hell yeah, we're here. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> we out here. <laughs> yeah, I, I know we're almost out of time, but like even a year ago in the program, I was like one of like five women in our studio, in Hadil's studio. And um, this semester, it's it's blown up. Like there's like 30 students instead of like only like 14. Um, and my team this semester is all women, which is just yes, crazy because I, I, there was never even that many people to begin with. So it's neat to see more people like me, I guess, you know, that's awesome. It is awesome. Y'all well, should email us. Like if we're giving yeah, you please. our email, we're serious. Like we're like, if somebody gives you their email and it's like, feel free to contact me freaking contact us like that's why we're giving it to you <laughs> you have yes. my permission to ask me to review your resume I love doing that it, it gives me so much satisfaction so please please do any artists out there uh, I'm happy to look at your portfolio love looking at this portfolio. if y'all want resources to like just start building stuff like I have a, a I have a library and I will devote time like I'll talk your ear off about all sorts of stuff like boom so. All right, y'all. Um, I am going to sign us off now. Thank you so much for our panel and everybody have a fabulous, fabulous day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.